from Microbe TV. This is Infectious Disease Puscast episode 20, recorded on January 18th, 2023. I'm Daniel Griffin, and joining me today is Sarah Dong, the featured educator of the month. We will put the link in on our show notes. Oh, thanks, Daniel. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Dong. Welcome to another Puscast. References, as always, are available in our show notes at microbe.tv, the home of our growing multimedia empire. Puscast is a review of the infectious disease literature for the last two weeks that we found interesting or entertaining. And on to the literature, shall we? Um, and so I will kick us off with our viral section. Remember to listen to TWIV clinical updates for timely viral related information as well. Um, I pulled a paper from Transplant Infectious Diseases entitled Neuroinvasive West Nile Virus Infection in Solid Organ Transplant Recipients. Um, so this discusses 24 solid organ transplant patients with, as you guessed, neuroinvasive West Nile virus infection from 07 to 2021 from Mayo Clinic in Arizona. And actually, there was a West Nile virus outbreak in 2021 that had a final count of almost 1,700 cases. And so this is sort of pulled from amongst those and actually is the largest cohort of solid organ transplant recipients um, in the literature with neuroinvasive West Nile virus infection. And just to pull out a couple things, the initial disease presentation typically was GI symptoms and fever for majority of patients, although they may have had weakness and headache and neutrophilic CSF changes if they um, underwent an LP. And then in the late course, you progress to having encephalopathy, flaccid paralysis, and in this case uh, group, 71% ultimately were transferred to the ICU. Um, five had some type of cognitive impairment, and 14 of the total had acute flaccid paralysis. Almost all patients, 23 of the 24, were treated with IVIG alone or in combination with interferon alpha 2b. And then looking at outcomes, there was a 36% 30-day mortality. So six patients died during hospitalization due to complications from their infection, and another two patients were discharged to hospice without clinical recovery. Um, and there were four of the 16 um, other patients who returned to their baseline function at discharge, so um, pretty severe disease. And I, I think that really is the take-home, which most transplant ID fellows and attendings know is that neuroinvasive West Nile virus and solid organ transplant should really scare you and is quite devastating. And so another sort of reminder that was not directly from this paper, but is that the incidence of donor-derived West Nile virus in patients who receive a solid organ transplant from a viremic donor is somewhere probably around 87%. Um, with a subsequent 70% who developed encephalitis. So I'd say separately, I, I wrote that I learned a little bit about Arizona and their seasonal West Nile virus spikes and monsoon season, um, but a really great resource and, and something for people to check out, even if you're not a transplant ID person. Yeah, really, uh, really devastating, actually. Um, yeah. yeah. West Nile virus infection terrifies me. <laughs> I, yeah, it, it's hard. It should. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we we certainly have West Nile here in in the New York area. We we saw a yeah. number of cases this um, this summer, um, and actually at one point when I was out in Colorado in uh, Fort Collins, that's I identified the first case of West Nile state of Colorado. That's wow. one of my um, maybe I, I look I look for zebras when I when I should, <laughs> um, but yeah, we actually had the highest incidence of West Nile cases one um, one summer. So uh, really, it, just devastating. Um, all right, the article. Clinical Markers of Post-Chikungunya Chronic Inflammatory Joint Disease, a Brazilian cohort published in PLOS Neglected Tropical Disease. So uh, let me start with some background. So chikungunya fever is a viral arboviral disease clinically divided into three phases. So there's an acute, post-acute, and chronic, uh, starting to sound like some other things. Uh, chronic cases correspond to 25 to 40% of individuals. So chronicity is actually um, more of a rule than an exception here. Um, though most of most of these cases are characterized by long-lasting arthralgia, so joint pain alone, um, but many of them exhibit persistent 
or recurrent inflammatory signs that define this post-chikungunya chronic inflammatory joint disease. Um, so these investigators aim to identify early clinical markers of evolution to um, this post-chikungunya um, chronic inflammatory joint disease uh, during the acute and the post-acute phases. So what did they find? Um, they found that the relative risk of chronification, I love that word, was higher in women compared to men, relative risk of 1.5, um, being symptomatic at day 21 was a risk factor for a chronification relative risk of 1.3. Um, significant was also observed for several other things such as reported edema. That was relative risk 3.6. Um, reported hand and or small joints edema, feet small joints edema, relative risk 4.22. Um, Periarticular edema observed during physical exam, relative risk of 2.89. Um, but one, um, say, reassuring thing um, was they found that patients with no physical findings, no findings in physical exam at day 21, um, were at significantly lower risk of chronic evolution. That was a relative risk of 0.41. So, um, you know, part of this is interesting for chikungunya. Um, part of it is potentially, um, you know, ideas to think about folks that develop uh, post acute sequelae of COVID. Um, is there some way during that initial period uh, to pick up the folks that are going to progress so we actually can can keep watching those folks, keep helping, um, keep validating their experience uh, rather than sort of losing them and then having them find a, um, a sympathetic ear? Yeah. Well, I'll move us into our bacterial section. Again, be sure to listen to This Week in Microbiology. I pulled a report on the cholera outbreak in Haiti, September 2022 to January 2023, which was published in MMWR. So on September 30th, 2022, so a couple months ago, after over three years of no confirmed cases, the Haitian Ministry of Public Health and Population was notified of two patients with acute watery diarrhea in the metro area of Port-au-Prince. And this was later confirmed as Vibrio cholera. As of January 3rd, there were over 20,000 suspected cholera cases uh, reported with an estimated 79% of patients hospitalized. And they published this moving 14-day case fatality ratio of about 3%. So as a reminder, cholera is transmitted through ingestion of water or food contaminated with fecal matter and can cause acute, severe watery diarrhea that rapidly leads to dehydration, shock, and ultimately death if not treated properly. Um, and so you know, they took a little bit of time in the paper also to point out that with Haiti's ongoing sort of social unrest changes that that's really impacted the public health infrastructure that has been a bit of a factor in really contributing to the environment that allowed this resurgence because it, it did look like it was the same cholera identified from back, I think it was 2010. I should have written down the exact year. Um, but just an update. I'm sure a lot of people have been following that maybe in the news as well. Okay. The article Legionella bononiensis species, um, isolated from a hotel water distribution system in northern Italy, was published in Open Access Journal, International Journal of Systematic and Evolutionary Microbiology. Just when you had all the 64 Legionella species memorized, one more Legionella <laughs> species to add to the list. Oh, Legionella. <laughs> well, uh, my next one is quite short. I, this is from Infectious Diseases and Therapy, Contemporary Pharmacotherapies for Non-Tuberculosis Mycobacterial Infections, a Narrative Review. Uh, I do really love uh, TB and NTM disease, so I think it's a little biased, but I wanted to give a shout out to this review article that really walks through all the drugs that are available for treatment, both um, ones that have been studied more frequently, but also sort of more novel agents. And I think if you're already looking at things like the IDSC treatment guidelines to think about which drugs to use, this is a really nice complement to that. Um, and so you can check out sections on other agents such as bedaquiline and clofazamine and linazolid. So a good refresher to, to get you caught up on all the options that we have for NTM disease. All right. So was it NTM or just your ability to mention linazolid again? <laughs> Maybe it's both. 
<laughs> All right. The article defining the optimal duration of therapy for hospitalized patients with complicated urinary tract infections and associated bacteremia was published in CID. And you know, this this article touches on a real bread and butter area of medicine. Um, I was making these recommendations just today, more than once. Um, these are the results of an observational study of patients um, 18 years of age or older at 24 United States hospitals um, to identify the optimal treatment duration for patients with complicated urinary tract infections. Um, eligibility was limited to those with associated bacteremia. Uh, the primary outcome was recurrent infection with the same species within 30 days of completing therapy. Um, 1,099 1, patients met eligibility criteria and received seven 10 or 14 days of therapy. So what is that? One Constantine unit, <laughs> two hands, or two Constantine units of therapy. Um, there was no difference in the odds of recurrent infection for patients receiving 10 days and patients receiving 14 days of therapy, um, adjusted odds ratio of 0.99. That's basically the same. An increased odds of recurrence was observed in patients receiving seven days versus patient receiving 14 days of treatment, adjusted odds ratio of 2.54. Um, when limiting the seven-day versus 14-day analysis to the 627 patients who remained on intravenous beta-lactam therapy or were transitioned to highly bioavailable oral agents, differences in outcomes no longer persisted. Um, of 76 patients with recurrent infections, 11%, um, 10%, and 36% in the 7, 10 and 14-day groups, respectively, had drug-resistant infections. Um, so I've sort of summed this up, which I think is really interesting. You know, we, we often hear about recommendations of 10 to 14 days of therapy. Um, it looks like 10 is just as good as 14, but it looks like if we get really high um, levels, so if we can either do that intravenous or through um, great oral bioavailability selections, um, we can have the same outcomes with seven as we're getting with 10. Love it. Move that number down a little bit. Um, in JAC Antimicrobial Resistance, I selected an article, Phenaxomycin to Prevent Recurrent C uh, Clostridioides Difficile. What will it cost in the USA and Canada? Um, and so to get to the overall conclusions in point, the authors concluded that increased drug expenditure on phenaxomycin may not be offset through recurrence prevention unless the phenoxomycin price is negotiated, meaning the cost in the USA and Canada of using phenoxomycin as first line costs more than what it could help in reducing infections down the road. Um, the authors took randomized trial data comparing phenoxomycin and vancomycin with medication costs from the BA federal supply schedule for the US and the Quebec drug formulary for Canada. They identified price points of 1,140 US dollars and 860 Canadian dollars uh, at which or below which the use of phenoxomycin is likely to be cost equivalent or cost savings. Um, I will say these cost savings paper and like how they did the analysis is definitely not my strength, but um, it <laughs> helped having sort of a bottom line of, of what they uh, to come as far as this price point. So I think interesting, it's been a big part of the conversation about can we get to using phenoxomycin more commonly here in the States? Yeah, and no, Canada. Very, Sorry, yeah, and very. Canada. <laughs> and Canada. And Canada, eh? Um, no, this is a great, I mean, this is a great uh, discussion point, Sarah. Um, this just came up today. We were doing our weekly um, urgent care discussion, um, yeah. talking about, interesting enough, C. diff. Um, that's what we do. Um, and uh, it really came up this point. What is first line? Is it still vancomycin? It really, it, it comes down to price points, right? I mean, uh, fidaxomycin is a, is a better therapy, um, but it's more expensive. So currently still vancomycin standard of care. But boy, if you could just drop that price of fidoxomycin, or when it does drop because the uh, you know patent will wear off, uh, then it, it is actually a superior option from a you know, efficacy standpoint. Yeah. 
All right. So I got a comment from a Marilyn Fabry, a local infectious disease doctor, about the article evaluating predictive value of surgical resected proximal bone margins in diabetic foot osteomyelitis with clinical outcomes at one year published in OFID. So I wanted to clarify. Um, I actually, you know, I went through the abstract, I went through the article. It's not as well worded as it really should be. Just sorry, just being honest with uh, the authors there. Um, but um, let me just hit, you know, just to recap the results section, as they say. Per the results section of the 92 cases, 57 had negative margins. 35 had positive margins. Um, this is this whole issue about what do we do post-amputation. Um, 49 of the 57, so 86% of patients with negative margin resulted in a successful outcome compared to 65.7% in the positive margin group. So a little bit better success. Um, but when, you know, and I joked about this, when they talked about readmissions, uh, those were limited to surgical site complications for non-amputation related interventions. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if you had to get an amputation, they, they admitted you, and, but they didn't count that. <laughs> Uh, well, speaking of OFID, I have another, actually, I think my next two are both from OFID. Uh, the first one to round out our bacterial section is post-operative inflammation and fever after elective aortic valve and aortic root replacement, a retrospective cohort study. So this paper was trying to take a look and analyze the post-op course of inflammation and fever in these uh, patients who have cardiac surgery, and this is a very common ID consult uh, and comes up all the time. So I I immediately selected this one just to see what they had. Um, it's a retrospective single center cohort study. They included three groups of adult patients after elective cardiac surgery. So aortic root with aortic valve replacement. Some may know this as the Bental procedure, valve sparing root replacement, and isolated surgical aortic valve replacement. They did exclude reoperations and pre-existing infections. Of the 307 patients who had one of these three surgeries, 71% had some type of post-op fever. Um, looking at the table, it ended up being, I think, about somewhere around two days after their surgery. The fevers occurred more significantly after the patients who had a Bental procedure, 84%, and the valve-sparing root replacement, 83%, compared to the isolated surgical aortic valve replacement. They ultimately identified 17 patients with fever that was attributed to infection versus 202 who carried this diagnosis of post-op inflammation without infection that was identified. Um, and one of their conclusions is that they found that the patients who were identified to have, I was about to say true infection, I don't know if that's the right way to say it, who were called uh, infection did have higher fevers. It was 38.8 Celsius versus 38.4, and they seemed to have a higher number of days of fever and ultimately of admission that were longer. So, uh, you know, I, I think that probably sort of aligns with what people would think if someone has a persistent fever that we would be more worried about infection. But I think interesting to take a look at this sort of nebulous uh, post-cardiac surgery <laughs> fever, because um, I think oftentimes it's it's a bit difficult to... Um, sort of work collaboratively to look for infection, because I think often the assumption is that there is not an infection present. All right, moving us on to fungal. I have pulled two, these next two papers are kind of paired, I would say, in OFID, uh, fungal nomenclature, managing change is the name of the game. And so if you want to provoke heated discussion in ID circles, all you need to do is bring up the shifting names for and then you can insert whatever microbe you want here. I'm going to say candida for this paper. Um, and so as many know, fungal nomenclature has been changing based on molecular-based technologies. So this has changed how fungal species are defined and identified. And um, ultimately, their phylogenetic relationships are being revised and taxonomical errors are corrected um, since we typically use phenotypic classification before. So this, out, this article outlines the rationale for name changes across major groups of clinically relevant fungi. And as an example, the authors talk about candida first, which is a, a large variable group of yeast that were initially grouped together based on their morphology. And 
I learned this part, lack of defined telomorph. But now as we've gotten more extensive studies, Canada has been broken up and renamed. And so the Canada group and the Lateromyces clade has kept that Canada name. So Canada albicans and Prapsilosis and tropicalis. But Canada glabrata is now part of the Nacosomyces clade. Probably saying that wrong. You can someone can tell me how to pronounce it. Um, and Candida cruzii is part of the Pitchia clade. Um, and so figure one shows some groupings. One of the I guess advantages in this setting is that the groupings uh, actually can be paired with their decreased susceptibility to azoles and amphotericin B on the um, newer newer names. But again, I think. This is one side of the argument. The authors argue that the criticism of name changes leading to dismissal as non-pathogens or other clinical disruptions has little evidence to support them. And since there are no guidelines on adapting nomenclature change, they made a few recommendations in the paper. So sort of at a similar time, there was a point counterpoint in clinical microbiology entitled What's in a Name? Clinical Microbiology Laboratories Use Nomenclature Based on Current Taxonomy. I liked this one because it focused a little bit more broadly rather than just on fungi. Um, and the, the point being updating taxonomy is critical for clinical labs and the counterpoint being microbial taxonomic reclassification. Just because something is correct doesn't make it right. Um, and I actually mostly pulled this paper, one, to tell people this is a great way to read about both sides, but two, there is a quote directly in the paper from the Big Lebowski, which I am now <laughs> going to uh, read here. In essence, taxonomy can be summed up with the immortal words of Jeffrey the Dude Lebowski. Yeah, well, you know, that's uh, just your opinion, man. So I have no doubt that our podcast audience has very strong opinions, but I thought both of these papers were um, interesting. But I think I like the point counterpoint more. Any thoughts, Daniel, before I well, move on? I, I don't know if you know this, Sarah, but I did quote from the Big Lebowski in my um, PhD dissertation. I did not. Yeah, <laughs> yes. So well, I. Uh, <laughs> well, which quote was it? <laughs> Uh, I, you know, it was, so I, I, I had, my PhD dissertation was on the human B1 cell and a, a phenotype, phenotype of that. Um, and, uh, there was a lot of controversy, a lot of people challenging. Um, and it was his, his quotation about, uh, this aggression will not stand. <laughs> well, I feel like I'm behind the times. I have not quoted Big Lebowski in anything <laughs> that I have written, but I will add it to the list of things I need to accomplish in my career. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> in PLOS Pathogens, I selected another article in the fungal section, Race and Ethnicity, Risk Factors for Fungal Infections. So this review took a look at racial and ethnic identities as risk factors for acquiring fungal infections, as well as how they may relate to risk for severe disease. And they found that risk factors for aspergillosis and other invasive mold infections largely appear related to environmental differences and underlying social determinants of health, although immunologic aberrations and genetic polymorphisms may play a role and need to be looked into a little bit more. Although Black and African American individuals appear to be at higher risk for superficial and invasive candidal infections and cryptococcosis, the reasons were unclear and seemed to potentially be more related to, again, underlying social determinants of health, disparities in access to health care, um, and other uh, socioeconomic differences. And their other um, sort of next point was risk factors for all endemic fungi were likely largely related to social determinants of health as well as socioeconomic and health disparities. So uh, I will sort of summarize this as the risk factors are much more likely to be related to racism and underlying differences in exposures and social determinants of health rather than race um, as the construct that's been used before. So um, interesting paper, and I thought I would highlight it. Um, and I think, yeah, that rounds out our fungal section for today. Okay. So parasitic, be sure to listen to this week in parasitism. Um, as a teaser, we have a very exciting guest coming on um, for our next episode. It's uh, it's actually Dr. Jesse Stone, the first person on the planet to uh, whitewater kayak the White Nile. 
Um, so make sure people listen. She's got a great case that she's going to share with us. And uh, the article, Mosquito Net Use in Early Childhood and Survival to Adulthood in Tanzania, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, now, it has been hypothesized that in high transmission settings, malaria control in early childhood, less than five years of age, might just delay the acquisition of functional immunity and shift child deaths from younger to older ages, suggesting ultimate harm instead of benefit. So here the investigators used data from a 22-year-old prospective cohort study in rural southern Tanzania to estimate the association between early life use of treated nets and survival to adulthood. Participants who were reported to have used treated nets um, at half the early life visits or more had a hazard ratio for death of 0.57. Um, as compared to those who were reported to have used treated nests at less than half the visits. Um, the corresponding hazard ratio between five years of age and adulthood was 0 0.93. All right. And I actually am going to wrap wrap things up in the miscellaneous section with, um, I will say, an area that I am sensitive to, the article Probiotic. <laughs> For pathogen specific staph aureus decolonization in Thailand, a phase two double blind randomized placebo controlled trial was recently published in The Lancet Microbe. Um, perhaps I should be friendlier to probiotics. I was <laughs> recently in Africa where a boy ended up with uh, cephalic tetanus uh, because they had treated his. Um, his circumcision wound with a cow dung poultice. Um, people wanted to know why. I suggested that was their form of probiotics. Well, these are the results of a single center phase two double blind randomized placebo controlled trial in adults from the Songkhla region of Thailand who were colonized by Staph aureus. Um, participants were allocated one to one. Participants received 250 milligrams of um, Basically, they're going to eat a bacteria. They're going to eat probiotic B. subtilis, MB40, or placebo once per day for 30 days. And staph aureus colonization was determined after the last dose was received. Um, the primary outcome was decolonization by staph aureus um, in the intestine. Um, they checked the nares. Um, and what did they find? Oral probiotic B subtilis resulted in significant reduction of staph aureus in the stool, 96.8%, uh, and in the nose, 65.4%. So maybe even a little bit better than those uh, chlorhexidine baths and uh, mupirocin up the nose and bleach baths. And you know, one of the points they actually make is this does really elucidate that Staph aureus is actually living and colonizing the gut. Yeah, well, that's really interesting. Um, well, that brings us to the end of this podcast. As always, the references for this show are available at microbe.tv, the home of our multimedia empire. You can find the Infectious Disease Puscast at Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv forward slash Puscast on your favorite podcaster as well. Um, we love to get your comments, questions, paper suggestions, uh, corrections. Uh, just send them to Puscast at microbe.tv. Um, and, uh, you know, we're actually uh, still in a, a fundraiser over at Parasites Without Borders, but consider supporting the science shows of Microbe TV uh, by going to microbe.tv forward slash contribute. I'm Sarah Dog. You can find me on Twitter at swindong, at Febrile Podcast, or at febrilepodcast.com. And I'm Daniel Griffin, and you can find me at ParasitesWithoutBorders.com, on Twitter at Daniel Griffin MD, as well as on the other podcasts, This Week in Parasitism and This Week in Virology Clinical Updates. And as always, thank you for this most interesting consultation and allowing us to participate in the care of this most difficult and challenging case. We shall continue to follow along with you. Thank you, and dictation, and goodbye. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Another podcast is infectious. <laughs>